Um, then two other things. I think in your minds, questions about, uh, about the recently unearthed scandal at NYS. NYS means National Youth Service, for those that don't know. But if you didn't know, then uh, you'd, you'd probably be in a different planet. Um, so for those of us that have been here, NYS is, uh, is something that we understand. But I'll say this, a few points on this. It is unfortunate, uh, no, 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 let's, that's not the word. Let's, <laughs> let's rephrase. It is unconscionable that such losses of public funds would take place at this moment or this day and age. Of course, in addition to the loss of the needed resources, uh, there is the, there's also the loss of public trust. So we feel that loss in those two areas, or those losses, the funds and also the loss of public trust. Now there is the question, okay, but uh, Governor, how does the central bank uh, oversee the compliance by banks? Because, you know, and some of you have written this, the banks must have been involved. Uh, well, I'll tell you, we do have that responsibility. It's in our mandate to supervise and to oversee banks uh, in, and their compliance to the tenants, or should we say the requirements of the various legislation um, and the ones obviously that are, uh, that are at stake here or at, uh, are relevant here relate to the anti-money laundering and uh, combating of financing of terrorism, AMLCFT as we call it, right? And uh, of course the other requirements that are prescribed by the Proceeds of Crime and Anti-Money Laundering Act, or CAMLA for short, other regulations, and in the, including the Banking Act and uh, various other guidelines. We generally do this through on-site and off-site surveillance. And I'm sorry if I take a bit of time and try and uh, clarify a little. Um, one of the ways we do this is through the annual routine uh, on-site inspection of banks. We do this generally annually. And we check what uh, has happened in, and how they are allowed, a bit, uh, you know, auditing, as it were. And then, of course, we do target inspections or targeted inspections based on uh, the specific information that we may have from other regulators, in particular FRC, um, this is the Financial Reporting Center, or other things you know, that may come to our attention in various ways. Um, we will then conduct a targeted inspection on a particular thing and expand out of that. So you think of it as a launching point. So we get that piece of information, and once we go in, we'll look at all the tenants that surround that and branch out from that. Now, we have also provided banks with uh, specific guidance as to how they should do various things. Um, for instance, uh, how they should do the suspicious transactions uh, reports, trans suspicious transaction reports, STR for short, and uh, you know, banks should flag uh, for STRs things such as large, frequent, unusual transactions um, that are not related to a customer's normal business, uh, or for that matter, things, uh, reluctance to provide documentation, Anyway, all these large and unusual activities in dormant or inactive uh, accounts or company accounts who are transacting mainly in cash. I mean, these are all reasons to flag um, specific transactions. And it's on that basis that actually the banks uh, actually um, observe the AML, CFT tenants and other tenants. So, um, I think the point I would make, though, is that all that has been happening, but it's also important, if you ask me, uh, how to, uh, oops, um, uh, just this morning I was, uh, when I was talking to some people, um, I told them that there's a Russian phrase, getting lost in a forest of three, 
trees. So I feel like I'm lost in a forest of three papers, three pieces of paper, which is not good. But in any event, the point for me is just simply that uh, over the last uh, two years, three years, we have actually strengthened some of the requirements under the AML-CFT framework. Uh, some of your readers have uh, indicated that they are very concerned that actually when they go to move, let's say, one million shillings in cash, they go through various hoops. And how is it possible that somebody could come through and move, I don't know, 100 million in cash? Uh, and save, uh, or whatever, whatever other accusations there are today. But I just want to make this point that actually we've improved, strengthened the regulations and prudential guidelines. And uh, it's true in January, we did issue this circular, January of 2016, uh, issued this circular relating to movement of uh, cash uh, above, say, 1 million Kenya shillings. But also we have followed it up with other uh, requirements uh, or should we say other guidelines that maybe you are not aware of, two banks. And one of these requires that, uh, or required in February of 2016, uh, we require that all banks submit declarations on compliance with all applicable AML CFT laws, regulations, prudential guidelines, and things like that. And we require that the CEO declares under oath that they are actually compliant with those, they understand and are compliant with those things. I'm making the point that uh, there cannot be any excuse that a CEO or the board does not understand the requirements of uh, AML, CFT, or the various other regulations and guidelines that, there, that are there. And we've issued other additional guidelines for sure is not guidelines or lack thereof. But I want to put that to rest. The guidelines are there, we enforce them, and we will continue to enforce them. So what happened here? So the issue may be, uh, it's not an issue of enforcement or lack of understanding, it is an issue of uh, maybe people not following the guidelines deliberately or, their, or deliberately, because how else could you make a mistake that on things that you are completely aware of. So now we hypothesize, but I think the point here is that what we are doing uh, is the specific investigations that we are conducting, right? So as you know, these investigations are in high gear. Um, I know there has been uh, press conferences, there has been statements, for instance, by the, uh, the Director of Public Prosecution and uh, I just want to uh, let you know that the CBK is working closely with the Director of uh, Criminal Investigations, DCI, and other investigating agencies on this case. So we are really embedded in that investigating sort of environment. And as you know, uh, the, there are two directions on this case. There are two directions that we are pursuing. Uh, the, and you could say that uh, the first is uh, the, from the recipient's perspective, and uh, this is the first phase. And the reason for that is, as was explained yesterday, was to, uh, is to recover the resources as quickly as possible. And as you know, some of those have been frozen in particular ways. So enhancing the recoverability. And uh, so that's one direction. So the recipients and those that were involved in the, in the uh, let's say, authorization and all those other things. And then, of course, you have the other dimension, which is banks and other entities that may have been involved uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this whole case. And that, as was mentioned, that is the second phase that we will move towards. At the end of the day, all those that are complicit in this or who are involved in this will be held accountable. There's no doubt in our minds. Um, that's where this is going. And we obviously will need to uh, have a thorough investigation 
as you can see, um, is happening to ensure that uh, as obviously the recoverability, but also to ensure that this is brought to the fore correctly as to sustain charges and things like that. I would want to say that uh, even as this happens, the investigations, in a sense, are working from two directions, right? So from the receipt, from the beginning, which is where the banks, uh, which is where the uh, the authorizations and things like that are done, and also from the end, meaning where the the recipients. Um, so I just want to make the point that uh, even as you say there are two phases, even as it's clear there are two phases, the investigation is actually coming from uh, two directions. And for those of you that understand this, this is a pincer move. Um, I don't know if that's understood, but uh, I, I throw that in. That's all I would want to say about this case, uh, particularly because the investigation is ongoing. I don't want to say anything beyond this. Finally, and I'm sorry if I'm taking too much time, Wallace. Um, <clears throat> I think all of you saw recently um, a, a draft financial, code, financial markets conduct bill. This is the financial market conduct bill 2018 that was circulated, I believe, um, on Thursday last week, or sometime last week. Uh, now, we also became aware of this bill at the same time as you did. So it was commissioned by the National Treasury. And the bill itself, as you know, reading it, it is uh, intended, among other things, to promote a fair, non-discriminatory uh, marketplace um, for access to credit and uh, providing uniform practices and things like that. So it's really more market conduct thing. Now, the bill draws heavily from what we call a twin peak model. This is something that we have discussed, uh, I wanted to say ad nauseum, uh, about financial architecture in our jurisdiction. And the twin peak model in a nutshell, is you have two regulators for a sector. Uh, so you'd have this sort of prudential regulator. And then you'd also, so that's the one that sets the various prudential guidelines in terms of capital, in terms of liquidity, in terms of all those things. And then you have another regulator that's doing market conduct. So in terms of, you know, is that institution adhering to the, or rather is having good practices on uh, in the market and pricing, relation to customers, etc. all those things. Now, generally those two things are merged in one act. This is where we are today. So we do all that. Of course, the other elements, you have the ombudsman, you have uh, other entities, so it's not necessarily a completely uh, sealed off um, area that only the CPK can deal with, of course not. But I guess the point I would make is that that model, meaning when you distinguish them, uh, has been used in some countries. And there are difficulties with it. There are also some positives. It's not necessarily a sort of a slam dunk solution for anything, or for that matter, it's not something that you can dismiss just out of hand. Um, because yeah, in some countries, Australia for instance, um, it has worked. Uh, now also, for that matter, you have uh, South Africa that are struggling to get it in place. In some sense, it may even be an issue of uh, the way, and I'm sorry if I bring it down to this level, where you think of, uh, you know, you can drive on the left and you can drive on the right. But it better be all of you in a particular country agree to drive uh, on the left and, or on the right. Um, you understand what I'm getting at. So th there's nothing you can say intrinsically wrong about driving on the left or driving on the right. But you have to understand your where you are, where you're starting from, and then work with that. So we actually did make the point uh, when we have, when this matter was brought to the table, was this, we were discussing it back in 2016, um, that really uh, we would want a sort of a more, uh, let's say, incremental approach, rather than sort of suddenly having a dichotomy uh, in this. 
And that was it until we saw this bill when it was issued uh, for discussion, circulation, and things like that. It's true we did uh, meet with National Treasury uh, sometime in May uh, to discuss the issue relating to interest rate caps and so forth. Our view is very clear on this. This, this bill does not deal with the interest rate caps issue. And it does not deal with the fundamental issues that led to the interest rate caps. It is trying, it actually takes a step, in our view, in the wrong direction. Okay? The bill emasculates the central bank. You may call it the, the our action, our actions and stripping the central bank of powers to enforce the cups, and indeed other things as well. So I'll just go through a few points just to show you um, where is it that we are with this, right? In the first instance, this act, or rather the banking act, which is the one we work on quite a bit, ends up being subordinated to the Financial Markets Conduct Bill. This is something that we have a lot of trouble with, okay? So, secondly, uh, we have certain, it repeals certain provisions under the Banking Act for approval of fees, charges, and, uh, and other, other sort of requirements or re other prudential guidelines or other items from the Banking Act, which really effectively leaves bank customers at the wings of banks in respect of fees and charges. Thirdly, it repeals provisions in the Banking Act for the CBK to deal with reckless lending by banks. So here you are a regulator and you cannot control reckless lending by banks. Then why are you in power? Why are you working as a regulator? It limits the power of the central bank to issue prudential guidelines to banks. <coughs> Maybe a lot of you spent a lot of time reading the first part. Please also read the, um, uh, what do I call them? No? I'll find my way, don't. The schedules, what is deleted and so forth. So it limits the power of the central bank to issue prudential guidelines to banks. And guess what? It also limits the power of the central bank to place banks under receivership. Obviously, the CBK is concerned at the proposals to limit its mandate and independence, and will obviously be providing detailed comments to uh, the National Treasury on this. In our view, this really doesn't go forward. It goes backwards, substantially. Not only does it, our concern has always been um, proposing something that will be sustainable or will sustainably address the concerns that are led that led to the enactment of the interest rate caps. It's also not consistent with the envisaged regulatory framework or architecture of the region, East African community. So, in sum, this is the financial sector equivalent of being asked to trade in your well-serviced SUV for a souped-up Subaru. <laughs> it may have flashy lights, stabilizer at the back, noisy exhaust, and racing stripes, but it is still a Subaru. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not time for hubris. It's time for action. Make no mistake, CBK is under attack. This is a summons to act with courage to defend and strengthen it, reviving our hope in a common vision of a modern central bank at the heart of a vibrant financial system. <laughs>